And from one exciting panel, we're actually now moving on to the next one. There are only a few other industries in the world that have been disrupted as much by the digital revolution as the world of media. New digital distribution platforms enable everyone to publish everything from everywhere, giving billions of people around the world the opportunity to freely express their opinions and viewpoints on the one hand, but on the other, making it extremely hard and difficult to attribute value and validity to the shared content. That's very true, Johannes. But uh, we are hopeful that our next speakers uh, will have some very interesting few points on the relationship between traditional media brands and newly evolved digital platforms. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm welcome to the President, Technology and Data at Axel Springer, Stephanie Kasper. Ein Applaus zu Robert Richter, who is responsible for Google's partnerships in the sectors of broadcast media and entertainment in the EMEA region. Welcome. Ja. The head of news partnerships for Central Europe at Facebook, Guido Bülow. And the general director of the Austrian Broadcasting Corporation, ORF, Alexander Wrabetz. And the panel is moderated by Jeff Jarvis again. Welcome on stage. Again, yes. Again. Uh, good morning again. Uh, so now we have media and the platforms. Uh, my goal is to have this end in a group hug uh, <laughs> where, where everyone, everyone adores everywhere else. I, I think we, um, there is a reputation among media, especially Springer, uh, of fighting hard with the platforms. Uh, and, and we'll get into some of that, I think. But, but I also think that we constantly head to a new uh, reality. And the new reality we have, I was a little less blunt about this in the last panel because I had the ambassador on stage. But as an American, <laughs> in the age of Trump, uh, just yesterday, once again, uh, he went after journalists as the enemy of the people. Uh, and now he's going after the platforms and he's going after facts, and he's going after the sanctity of information. And so I would argue that everyone here is on the same side when it comes to that. And we have a new reality that we have to deal with. Uh, I don't want to make this American-centric, but, uh, but in terms of Donald Trump, I apologize to you all for what's happening. Um, so let's start with the positive. Uh, what's going right? in the relationship between media and technology. Stephanie. Yeah, I think, um, as you said, we have a reputation for fighting hard, but also we believe in something, and we believe in free speech, and we think we need a business model for journalism, and we see a lot of things going on that are turning into the right direction. So I have two colleagues <laughs> next, to, <laughs> next to me on this panel, and we, we are in very good discussion around what a business model for journalism could look like when a lot of stories are discovered on platforms and not on our sites and how we could work together on this and we make good progress. Um, so we see um, a new product on Facebook where our subscription uh, offerings are supported and where, of course, we don't get it right for the first time, but we are in very good mode to experiment and to learn as we go along. And we have a whole initiative at Google, Subscribe with Google, uh, being one of it, but also how we work with data, where we collaborate in, a ver in very good terms. So um, I would say a lot of things are happening. We cannot expect that we get it right for the first time. The approach is the right one. Alexander? Of course, it's uh, the topic uh, for us as classical media being the the market leader in classical television and radio and classical online here in Austria, how to, to transform ourselves into the new world. And of course, we are challenged by platforms like Google and Facebook. However, we have to recognize they are not so strong because they were supported by the US Marines, but because they offered services which obviously are appealing to the people. But now they got also these strengths and uh, therefore it is important to discuss 
uh, a policy. I am not talking about regulation, but about policies, which is the best way to protect an uh, European information ecosystem in a way uh, uh, where it's not the danger that the, 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 our democracies are uh, influenced by uh, users of these platforms in a way where it put in, is, uh, uh, democracy is put into danger from outside or even inside. And I see these discussions which are ongoing now for one year have also led to some reactions by our uh, colleagues. Uh, I think it's a better understanding now that it is important, even if you don't produce your, the media content, the information yourself, that it is important that on these platforms, on the one hand side, you avoid to have contents which are really against uh, democratic uh, rules, and on the other hand side, to have a strong journalistic media ecosystem uh, which is uh, supported and not damaged by the platforms to counterbalance uh, the misuse of uh, information in the, in, the, in, the, in the sphere of the platforms. I want to come back to that, that question of manipulation in just one second, but what's going right, gentlemen? Um, um, it's, so I would disagree that we challenge you. I think um, what really has changed is, or technology has always had an impact on the media industry. Right? And I had, I had an interesting breakfast with Max Giordano this morning, who is later on stage here, and we were thinking back to the year 2005. Um, I started in television in 2005, and uh, we had just a couple of hundred million smartphones back then. Today we have over three billion smartphones, and smartphones and technology really changed the way people are consuming media, not the platforms. So, um, and I think we have, we have to keep that in mind, that we have a really convergence of devices, platforms, content providers, and um, for Google, I mean, for us, it's, it's really important to support the media industry because we have this mission, we organize the world's information and make it universally discoverable, um, and um, this accounts for content as well. So for quality content, for news, our job is to connect audiences with um, suppliers of content, with suppliers of news, uh, and we are only su successful when our partners are economically successful. Um, and in the case of ORF, um, when they are successful to deliver quality information and to fulfill its public mandate, then we are successful as well, and we have to keep that in mind. Peter. Um, I only can echo that, to be honest. Um, I mean, we have seen, or we know, First of all, that our role of, has, has changed dramatically in the last couple of years. Um, um, the role of Facebook, our responsibility, and we take that responsibility. And um, especially when we're, when, we're, when we're working together with, with publishers, we understand much better now, much clearer now, that um, publishers are um, one of the core pillars of a demo democratic society. So what can we do to support the democratic society is to support journalism, to support publishers. And um, Stephanie just mentioned that. I mean, we're building for publishers like subscription products. We just launched uh, video monetization on Facebook to support journalism. We're also looking into um, having uh, donation, supporting donation models for freelancer journalism um, or those publishers that aren't technically having a, a subscription model, for example, the correspondent or Zetlon in Denmark, which is different models. So we're looking at all these different kind of, of models to support high quality journalism on our platform. So let's now go to the topic that, that you raised, Alexander, about, about manipulation of the platforms. And, and that's the way I tend to look at it. I, uh, uh, a leader in our field, uh, Claire Wardle, says, don't use the term fake news because it has been co-opted by others. And I think what's going on is there are are bad players trying to manipulate all of us, media included, mm. and, and we have a common, again, a common enemy, a common foe. Um, and I think there's been a fundamental change recently, which is important for this relationship, which is that, and, and I'll put myself here, I believed strongly, dogmatically, in an open internet, and that the openness was the, was the value that we really had. Um, the problem is that we've all learned that openness leads to manipulation, to trolls to bad actors. We knew that about spam, now we have 
um, psychologically motivated bad actors, which are trolls, and politically bad mo motivated bad actors, which in our case tend to be Russians. Um, uh, and, and so I think there is an opportunity here for a flight to quality. Uh, Google said last April that they would now account for the authority, reliability, and quality of sources and search results. Facebook has talked about reincorporating quality news back into the feed and giving it prominence. Twitter is now doing studies about its impact on the health of the public conversation. At the same time, however, I think that we in media have not fully admitted our role in the polarization of society, in pitting, in the case of America, red versus blue, black versus white, 1% versus 99%. We tend to pit huge pop parts of the population against each other. And I would argue that there's a few opportunities here. One is to promote quality news if we can figure out what that is. And another one is to make strangers less strange. Is to, is, to, is to build bridges among characters. I don't know if you all heard uh, last weekend, um, Die Zeit ran Deutschland spricht uh, with, I think, 28,000 people who met one-on-one -on -one with someone they disagreed with. That's not going to bring world peace overnight, but it's an idea about changing our idea of what we do in journalism. So in this notion of, of a flight to quality, uh, I'd like you each to, to dream a little bit about what the world looks like and what our relationship looks like to improve the quality of the public conversation? Anyone? First of all, I think uh, it does not uh, make sense to just accuse uh, the platforms uh, to be ma manipulating or support manipulation by emphasizing algorithms which support polarizing news. Yeah? Uh, uh, but we have to do it, we have to have these discussions, what are the algorithms, do you benefit from polarizing public discussion or uh, do you also, are you neutral, so to say. On the other hand side, of course, course we are ourselves, because part of our, not as a public service product, but as media mm -hmm. business model is to get uh, news to the people who, who gets attraction from the people, so also maybe to to, to, to think about uh, more uh, in which way also we uh, contribute to polarization and uh, uh, to how to even more concentrate on our strengths of journalism, check, recheck, double check, being unbiased, neutral, etc. So it also has to come from, 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 from both sides. Uh, uh, and uh, I think the discussion during the last year has shown there is consciousness on both sides, and now we have to follow the way. Stop it. Um, I would say that there are two things. One thing is really the bad guys, and there my hope would be that technology can identify bad guys much better, and that we should spend more time on really finding the ones who manipulate the system. And there, I would hope that there's like a common rule set how we will deal with it. The second is more the psychological thing that the internet is feeding a human flaw, I would say. So my attention span, I get so much noise. So if you don't exaggerate, if you don't go into a red mode, then you don't get my attention. That's something... I really have hope that um, if we come up with what's quality for institution like Facebook, for a publisher like Axel Springer, uh, we do this at the moment with the editors saying, of course, there, there are clicks and there's attention, but there are also other things and how can we measure it? Because very often you, I mean, we, um, we have the difficulty that the rule set that we develop and the standards that we have, that we need to scale them across the systems that are in place. I mean, if you have to uh, hire, I don't know how many teams, just putting away and then deciding, it will be not a scalable solution. So there we think, there we need a lot of brain to put into it. And also, I, I, I think it's the first positive step that now there was like a common understanding on what principles should rule on platforms. And I want to be part of this discussion. Is it like a, 
a positive filter so that you you have more um, I don't know quality sources up front, and then you define what's quality and what you want to see on uh, as a platform, and how to cut out the crap. But I think that's a task we need to take on now, and um, yeah, happy to to evaluate other options. Yeah, I think uh, when we're talking about bad actors, I think there's a lot of potential to working together. Um, it's something we're already doing in a couple of countries uh, with uh, lots of lots of publishers, non-profit organizations, for example, to fight the uh, fight against misinformation. Um, when I think back a year from now, I think we were having partners in four countries to figure out what's misinformation and, and having fact-checking organizations doing fact-checks uh, that helped us to uh, improve our machine learning to yeah, um, use artificial intelligence to fight the, um, against misinformation. Now we're live in 17 countries and uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks we're live in three more countries. So I see there's a movement, there's a will to um, cooperate and yet to join forces uh, to to remove bad actors or at least to demote bad actors and get, hopefully at some point get rid of them, although I don't believe that because we have seen spam since the beginning of the email. Um, what's much more difficult though is to figure out what is quality journalism. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know that much better than me because um, maybe you want to mention that, that you are... Oh, I, I forgot to do my disclosure. I'll do that in a second, yes. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. so, so obviously we're looking into uh, to figure out what is high quality journalism. But I guess uh, when I would ask every single one here in the room, it might be something else for each and every single one of you. And we're not talking, I don't see any um, people from Africa, for example. I don't see any people from, uh, I don't know, uh, South America. Uh, no kids here with, uh, that are 14 year olds. E each, each of them has a different understanding of quality and to figure out uh, one high quality standard for um, like seven billion people, how many have, do we have in, uh, on the world? Seven or eight million people? billion people right now, it's very difficult, but you know that much better than me. I'll come back to that in one second, Robert, first to you and then I'll... And I think there's another angle to it. How can we help um, so trusted guides of today um, to distribute their content to the audience? Um, uh, Mr. Vrabet's job really got complex. I think, you know, back in the days you only had a, one linear channel where you, where you deliver content. Um, and today you have to deliver content uh, to Facebook, to Instagram, to YouTube, uh, to whatever platform is out there. And it really got complex because different formats, different styles, um, and this really got complex. And I think our job as well is to help trusted guides of today, established media companies of today, to reach the audiences. And um, this is something I think we only can accomplish in a partnership. Um, and then also, you know, discuss what are the, what are the rules around platforms. And, and maybe to add on this, um, I think one important topic is also news and media literacy. Um, I mean, I, w I was just talking about the kids. I mean, kids nowadays have smartphones, smart, uh, mobile devices when they're six, seven, eight years old. They have access to millions and millions of sources and they don't know what is a, a credible source and what is a non-credible source. So I think at some point, um, society in general needs to take um, um, responsibility to train kids um, media literacy. And I mean, this, this is something that we're looking into as well. Uh, what can we do? How can we contribute and, and, and take our responsibility that, to that? Because you cannot just fight like the bad actors because they will be around like all the time. But to train people to understand what they're reading, what they're consuming, I think um, that is a very, very important part. And again, I think that is something where we can join forces, publishers, platforms, technology companies, um, governments, etc. Well, let me hit that, then I'll go back to your earlier point. Uh, there was research at New York University uh, out very recently from Josh Tucker that took 1,500 of the worst of the worst of the crap, uh, bad, lying disinformation, and they wanted to see who shares it. Anybody want to guess? It was white men over 65. Uh, and we keep worrying about kids, and immediately, so the kids are okay. It's grandpa and dad who are fucking up the world. <laughs> and so we've got to do something about that, right? And again, this is, this is in America where we have Fox News, where we have other uh, malign factors, but that, that matters. So my full disclosure here is that I've raised money for my school, not for myself, 
from Facebook. I'll be going after Google uh, again um, and others. Uh, and among the things that, that I'm looking at is how we work on the signals of quality. Next week, I'm at a meeting of Reporters Without Borders in Paris where we're trying to set standards around that. It's a very difficult problem. It's a very difficult question. And there is no single standard anywhere, certainly for the whole world. But we can, I think, help each other make better decisions. Uh, that includes especially the platforms. How do we tell them what sources are like? How do we give them more information? How do we in journalism meet standards ourselves and work on that ourselves? Uh, there's, there's another effort called uh, the Trust Project that works on this. Um, and then how do we in media avoid uh, spreading disinformation? There's a brilliant researcher in the U.S. named Dana Boyd who gave a talk last week to the Online News Association in which she argued strenuously that we in media are amplifying some of these lies and, 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 and issues of hate. We all have to worry about quality in, in new ways. We all have to have this opportunity to figure out what we're doing. Um, I saw a positive sign this morning uh, that there's a multi-stakeholder forum with the EU that announced that they were working with Google, Twitter, and Facebook on a code of practice on online disinformation. Um, the, the three areas, one is identifying uh, bots, two is accountability about that, and three is sharing data with researchers. I think that's a very positive step, and I think it's a better way to talk than regulation, than things like Nets Day Gay, uh, because rather than trying to tamp down the bad guys all the time, which we'll lose, how do we improve our standards and how do we work together? Yes, but even if we go this way as Europeans and find ways to cooperate in the, exactly the way you, you said, it's good. However, we Europeans cannot rely only to, 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 to US, US platforms or maybe in the future Tencent platforms to to, 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 to address our, our customers and to inform our people. So we have to transform our own traditional media organizations into new platform organizations uh, in, to organiza and uh, to construct these platforms in a way that they are open to communicate with other platforms. This is our player strategy, which we just uh, uh, started uh, uh, this, uh, these days uh, here in Austria. Uh, so this is important. And if we have to have our own platforms, with also with strong rules, with very transparent algorithms, etc., uh, then it's a, 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 a counterbalancing of the strengths of the U.S. platform. So you, so you have to go both ways, on the one hand side, to find ways how to cooperate together, but on the other hand side, to have a level playing field to develop European information platforms. Is, is that fighting yesterday's war, though? Uh, I mean, you, you have, in great measure, people moving from the platforms to chat. We see it certainly in China. We see it in WhatsApp in, in India and Brazil and Colombia, uh, that there's an entirely new frontier here which is going outside of media and platforms. If it's the yesterday's battle, it's a good and an important battle. Okay. Yeah, because if you lose the direct access to your customer mm -hmm. totally, yeah, uh, then it will be very difficult. And we cannot rely in the long run to have good discussions on the European levels with uh, multinational uh, uh, enormous big companies which are which have all together the three of you maybe have together uh, uh, cross, cross national product uh, similar to several European countries so it is good and important and has shown that uh, that Euro Europe has been reacting that there are no dis discussions uh, but you have to have uh, also the possibility to have and run your own platforms and Stephanie, I, don't by we the way, I, ahead, I, I very much agree. So I think it's very, very important to have uh, an own and operated platform like the ORF player. And I think we think it's a great project, uh, which we very much uh, support. So ORF has the advantage, which you've often spoken of, being a public entity with public responsibility. Uh, so you don't have to worry about what everybody else has to worry about, which is the attention-based economy. Stephanie, do we have a business model problem? 
besides the obvious that we don't have enough of it. Yeah. Um, but in terms of a media marketplace that is built on attention, mm -hmm. is that fundamentally corrupting? Uh, that we, all, we, we end up with clickbait, we end up with cats, mm -hmm. uh, or Kardashians, or Trumps, or mm -hmm. whoever. We end up with sensationalism. Do you have any optimism about reinventing the fundamentals of media? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that as a, when we first entered the internet and we're so thrilled that we could reach so many people, we left out one thing that was a direct customer relationship and to really understand what's a good product about. And this is also something I discuss always with Facebook and with Google. So if we want to if we want to have a business model which is stronger than the one that we have at the moment, which mainly consists of advertising and a bit of paid content, um, we need to be in a position where although we use platforms to reach customers, we need to be in a direct relationship and we need to understand the needs uh, of our customers better. So when the platforms are black box to us, we are just providing the content and then we are left out of it, we will not innovate to make a stronger model. So, more concrete to your question, um, we see that paid content now is finally picking up, but to be very, opt I mean, I'm optimistic, but I think we need to find a third and fourth pillar with more revenue sources, because what journalistic brands bring to the table is, of course, high reach, trust, a lot of engagement, and it's like, of course, you get the fans that will have a subscription, but then you need to cover more basic needs yeah. of, of people. And every brand needs to find out what's the best strategic fit. Do you move more into commerce field or do you provide other services or whatever you want to do with the audience that you have. But that's why I fight so hard for the direct customer relationship because if I don't have that for a significant portion of people who view my content, I cannot innovate with new revenue sources. We heard from, from Tencent this morning, uh, and I love this line which I'll steal now, is that, is that you don't see yourself as a platform, you see yourself as a tool, which means you see yourself in a position of helping people in their lives and doing what they want to do, not what we will try to tell them to do, mm -hmm. which is a different attitude than, than yeah. we've had, I think. Yeah. Um, you guys are in the same business model. You know, it's, whatever, what is wrong with it, we, we started it. No, I, I agree. So I think, so um, what you just said, we live in an age of instant gratification, right? Everything has to be super quick and, um, and what you describe with clickbaiting, that's, you know, uh, that's advertised business model. And so I agree with you. We need to find new business models. How can we monetize content and quality content? And it's individual what you, what you just said it before. And I like that um, quality is always different for everybody, right? Um, and um, I don't have an answer what is what is the new business model to monetize the content industry? Um, and I think we can only, you know, work on it together and it's a constant discussion and subscription is maybe one thing and, but maybe there are some business models out there that we cannot think about today and um, we, will, we might develop them in the future. <laughs> but what I have to say, we would not need a new business model, we classical media, if the two of you, not personally, would not be around. Yeah? because exactly of the fastest growing part of the advertising market, which was financing media in the, in the, in the last uh, well, spe 150 years, 100, 150 <laughs> years, yeah. Uh, uh, the fastest growing part of it uh, is consumed by the two of your uh, companies. You and can't wish the internet I, away. I, I, exactly, no, I come no, back to my earlier point, it's no, technology. I just want to explain the reason why we have to look for new business models and uh, 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 which is exactly the case. So uh, that means uh, if you, okay, 70% okay, of my business model is public service broadcasting, so this is quite You're secure. Pretty damn lucky, yes. But 30% of it is advertising, so we are in the same uh, boat as, as, as uh, Springer. And uh, so we have to, 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 of course, we have to develop uh, means, and I think uh, that uh, pay is uh, in particular for, for, for commercial uh, uh, 
uh, editorial uh, products a way which has to be developed. But on the third, a third column will definitely be the business model uh, of a data-driven business model. And there we have to be very careful on the one hand side to get level playing field, to get more transparency, to get a certain degree of uh, regulation, to get uh, copyright rules for European media in, in order to develop a new business uh, uh, model, as you said. And on the other hand side, to do it in a proper way, not uh, on one hand side trying to support an ecosystem for new business models and in the same way uh, destroying these business models. Well. I mean, I, I agree, and I agree with both of you that, that I think the relationship is what matters, and we were not good in that at media at the beginning days, uh, and we need to have uh, strong relationships. We need the data to be able to back that up, but then comes along GDPR, which I think in some ways is necessary, but in other ways harms that development. And then you now have efforts to develop new structures, and then along comes chapters 11 and 13 of the new, of the new law, that could, in one prediction, kill memes, kill the alphabet of the future before it exists. Um, protectionism is not a strategy for the future. Working together on in developing new models around a new reality is where I would hope that we could go as industries together. And I think that is something that we're already doing. I mean, uh, speaking of data, um, specifically with, with your team, I know that we're trying to figure out ways how, what can we do to share data um, while we have GDPR, um, ar the GDPR around. Um, obviously, I mean, we cannot share, like, I don't know, if Robert is on our platform, we cannot share his data. That is not possible. But, I mean, what can we do with aggregated data that supports, like, your funnel, uh, that you get more people into your funnel that potentially subscribe to your product and then you have the customer data. Um, yeah, so that is something that we're exploring because we see the need, and I mentioned that earlier. I mean, why do we do that? Because we see um, journalism is part of a democratic society and that we want to support, and um, obviously also high-quality journalism that we want to also thrive on our platform rather than crappy content, to be honest. So I recently redefined journalism because I have, I'm a professor and I have tenure and I can do that um, because I think we were thinking too narrowly about the idea of content. I think it is our job uh, in journalism is a job that we should share with the platforms. And this is what I, my definition is, to convene communities into civil, informed, and productive conversation. We're talking about more than just manufacturing content. We're talking about trying to support the public conversation, whether you're a public entity, whether you're a private entity, whether you're a platform or a journalism product. We have a crisis going on at some level in society. And we've got to look at our own responsibilities in what we do to improve the lot of society. So we have a mere three minutes left. Uh, let's try to solve the world's problems now. Um, <laughs> what, tell me, each of you, about your idea of a, an ideal relationship past business models, but to try to meet our responsibilities. Anyone? I think I, see, I also see uh, really fields uh, uh, of cooperation in the, in the regulation. For example, if you were talking about uh, the data protection guideline. This will be seen in 100 years as the, the symbol of this functionality of the European system, yeah? because it was a good idea put in a perfect, terrible result, which makes more problem. And now if it comes to the, the copyright protection guideline, we are sitting uh, in a certain way in the same boat, because also on the one hand side, we as European media and content providers will benefit, should benefit. On the other hand side, as platforms, we have the same questions that it should be practical not to kill the internet, as you said. So there, instead of uh, our lobbyists working against each other in a way, maybe in the discussions now during the trilogue, we could find ways which are beneficial for European and Asian and American platforms and uh, pro uh, still protect the, the, the rights of the content providers. Anyone? Let me think for a second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're allowed to pass, Stephanie. Um, Robert? Yeah, I think, I mean, we have like, as Axel Springer, we have the mission that we want to help people make better decisions, mm. be it 
if it's through journalism or through our classified platforms or through our marketing and e-commerce activities. And um, when I think about the relationship to the platforms, I mean, we are not that different from each other, but f in my view, it's like a platform is a good way for me to um, let other people discover my, my products, my offerings, etc. And also um, to share like this, this customer journey in a way that everyone profits from value creation that is there. So, and I think we are, as I said, we are in a, in a good way. It's, of course, we have this data piece, which maybe was good intent, not so well executed. Uh, but I think it was the right thing that it was, something was done uh, around uh, data protection, and I, I'm very optimistic that they will now uh, make it better in the second turn. Um, yeah, but if we really focus on customer needs when it comes to data, when it comes to better products, and the platforms make sure that they share the relationship to the user and also the value that is created, we will find a way. Robert? Um, as we have 10 seconds left, so I'll make it short. Um, see technology as an opportunity and not as a threat. Um, and I think um, that's really important to keep that in mind. Maybe the last one then. Um, let's build together great products for customers. Um, and by building great products for customers, I think we figure out solutions for both of us that will, yeah, that will work for both of us. I think that's a good, a good uh, we're not quite in a group hug, but, but, uh, but we're getting there, we I behaved. think. We uh, behaved. 80%, 70%? We're getting there, we're getting there. Uh, and, and, I, and I think to put the public first, not just as customers, but as the public, is what we all have to do, because we've got, uh, we got problems, but we can, uh, we can solve them together. Thank you all very much. Thank you, the panel. So, geht sich dann aus.